climate justice. I think it's inevitable that climate justice, environmental justice, are things that we can aspire to rather than things that we can deliver. Um, we are never all going to have the same quality of life. We are never all going to share the same quality of environment. Richer people, all other things being equal, are always going to be able to afford a better environment, a place with less pollution, with less traffic noise, whatever it is. And since we all cannot be equal, we will never have total environmental justice um, or, or indeed climate justice. But we can still aspire to it as an ideal. And what that means is that where you do find that there are gross abuses of environmental justice, such as that I was reading about in my dream world this morning about Bhopal, um, and how you know, even all these decades on from the original Bhopal accident, people are still dying in hunger and poverty as a result of, um, you know, of the injuries that they suffered. Something like half a million people, and hardly anyone has got compensation of more than about $500. For, um, you know, among all the people dead and injured and so on. And so here we have a gross environmental injustice. And at the very least, we can tackle the problem by looking at these instances of gross environmental injustice and how do you address them? The best way to address them is ultimately to make sure they don't take place. You know, the best way to address Bhopal isn't to go in and compensate people because there are things that can't be compensated for. You just want to stop them happening at all. And I think this is perhaps especially the case with climate, because one thing, you know, we've known about it for some time. The um, Climate Convention was signed in 1992, which is, what, 17 years ago? You know, we've known about it for some time. Um, and back in 1992, we all committed, you know, to do what we had to do collectively in the world to prevent dangerous anthropogenic climate change. We simply haven't done it. And so, we actually need to move, you know, to address this environmental equity question by actually doing something about climate and doing our best to make sure that we do not get into the zone of dangerous runaway climate change, um, which would be nothing less than a global catastrophe on such a scale that any question of compensation or whatever, you know, simply wouldn't even come into it. Um, now, this, another whole dimension to look at is that of international equity. Um, and, um, and this is at the root, for example, of contraction conversions, which you mentioned, and it's the idea that actually countries should all have the same right to emit greenhouse gases as other countries. And um, the, you know, certainly with contraction convergence, I agree about contraction <coughs> because that's absolutely necessary to stop dangerous climate change. On convergence, I think actually that that focus on carbon emissions as what you're trying to converge on is misplaced. Because ultimately, people don't want to emit carbon. People want lighting, heating, transport. Um, and, um, and, and, and so we should be looking for ways to converge in terms of quality of life and access to energy and goods and services that people want, rather than an equality of carbon emissions. And actually, I think that, that I've gone and say that an excessive focus on equality of carbon emissions is actually quite destructive and is at the heart of what's one of the main things going wrong in the climate talks currently, which is this idea that it's the rich world has to take on fast, deep cuts and that the poor world, represented by the G77, and this is really their position, you know, they're saying, well, you had your fun, you've emitted your carbon, now you stop emitting your carbon, and now it's our turn to emit our carbon, and to go on our own path of high carbon development. And I would say, well, actually, no, that is wrong. And what is actually rather hopeful at the moment is that a new group of nations, the Forum of Vulnerable Nations, has come forward, and they are saying something radically different, which is, no, we don't want your path of high carbon development. Apart from anything else, it's dirty, it's unhealthy, and it does actually represent collective suicide for the planet if we have all of the developing world burning up all its coal reserves. We simply cannot go that way. And, and they are then saying, you, the rich world, you have a different responsibility. Yes, you cut your carbon emissions, but actually the main thing the rich world has to do is to pay for poor countries not even to get on the carbon intensive development path in the first place and insofar as they have to get off it and do something else and um, and so what 
this actually does is it offers probably a rather better way forward because for rich countries to make rapid, I mean, we clearly should reduce our emissions and there's a lot of emissions that we can reduce in a highly economic way and we should do. But um, there are also some quite big things in terms of sunk infrastructure in power stations, whatever, some of which are quite new. And actually, economically, we're much better off going to a country like Zimbabwe with, with its looming power shortage and huge reserves of coal and saying, yes, yeah, Zimbabwe, let us help you. Let us actually give you a renewable power system, a low carbon development path, which we will pay for, um, so that you don't ever go exploiting your coal or building these coal-fired power stations in the first place. And, um, and, and in that way, we will be delivering equity in terms of the access to energy, the improved quality of life. We will fund, we in the rich world will be picking up the bills, but then the entire world can actually join in some kind of a common effort with a common mission to get greenhouse gas emissions under control and, um, and, and lead through to a, um, what one might call climate safety. So what we need is a mechanism to do that, um, and, um, and, and I see we've just got some photocopies, actually we could give those out, have we got some copies, because we can give those out. This is the um, Kyoto 2 system, I wrote a book, Z, Z books are just here, they've got some copies, but very briefly what it pr proposes is an approach for generating that, um, the funds necessary for funding, um, finan to finance a low carbon future, particularly in developing countries, to pay countries to keep their forests, um, uh, and, um, and to fund the necessary adaptation to inevitable climate change, just in terms of where we are now, with the, the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. The system is quite simple. It is to sell permits to emit, but levied upstream. And so what you're actually doing is you're telling the fossil fuel companies that no matter where they're producing fossil fuels anywhere in the world, they have to, they, they have to surrender permits um, against the carbon content of those fuels. And those permits are sold in an auction. Um, the people that actually have to end up buying them are the, are the fossil fuel companies. They surrender them, and the money from the auction goes into financing all of, all of these things. You know, and in, in particular, paying poor countries to keep their forests, financing a low carbon development path uh, and, and funding adaptation and, and, and a number of other things too, but there's no time here to go, to go into the detail of it. What you also need, as has been pointed out, the carbon market is not, you know, the price signal is something necessary because it will guide certain kinds of investment, but there's other kinds of things where it's a very poor driver and you would need a carbon price incredibly high, for example, to get people to change their choice of new cars to buy, you would need a carbon price so high to change that that would be incredibly painful to, for example, pensioners on low incomes trying to keep warm in winter. So there are certain things where you do need a direct regulation approach for energy efficiency and direct government expenditures. So that is another important part of it, is the direct regulation. Now, there is another equity principle embodied in this, which is that the rich countries have historically emitted far more carbon. Now, in this system, everybody would be paying the same carbon price now, including poor countries. So the poor countries might reasonably say, look, you know, we under this system would be contributing disproportionately. Now, the way to do that, I think, is to moderate the carbon price in the first few years and to have the rich countries. I think we can usually go back to a baseline of 1992, the date of the Climate Convention, and say that rich countries should make extra contributions to the climate fund um, in respect of their emissions from 1992 onwards in order to clear that carbon debt. That money goes into the climate fund to spend on all these good things, and meanwhile, the carbon price can remain at a relatively low level. But with the knowledge that it will rise higher and higher into the future. But as it does so, as the carbon price rises higher and higher, the investments have been made in low carbon technologies, um, both the research and the large scale deployment, so that in fact people aren't hurt. And poor people in, de in developing countries and indeed in rich countries are not hurt by this carbon price because the entire world has become far less dependent on carbon. Thank you.